A reading this morning is John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, and we'll read to verse 15. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This is God's holy word. May he add his blessing to it. You may be seated. And let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we lift up this time to you. We lift up ourselves to you. We ask that we would profit now by your word. Lord, that we would not miss the truth of what you're saying to us. We pray that you would stir in us by your spirit as we hear this word preached. Would you be with me as I preach it? And may you be with everyone who hears. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts that understand and cherish you most of all. We pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, how can we have eternal life? Or to put it another way, how can we enter the kingdom of God? This is the question of these, of these verses that we've been studying. And surely there isn't a more important question to ask. How can I have eternal life? How can I live forever? How can I enter into God's kingdom and to his presence? You know, when we think of that phrase, eternal life, we are touching on the highest good of all, eternal life. I mean, what is more precious than that. You think, what's more precious than life itself? We often think of that, right? You, you do anything to save a life, we would say. But what's more precious than even life itself? Eternal life. Eternal life. Jesus told his disciples that very thing. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? You see, there's, there's two types of life here. That you, if you try to save your life, your physical life, you'll lose your eternal life. You will lose spiritual life. You'll lose life forever. But if you would give up this life here and give it to Christ... The promise is, is that you will find your life, the true life, that you will not forfeit your soul, referring to that eternal life. What profit would it be to gain everything you could in this life, but in the end to lose your soul? You see, this matter of eternal life is the most important thing. This is the most important thing. But what is it exactly? What is eternal life? Well, John, here in John 3, we read these words of eternal life for the first time in the Gospel of John. He says to Nicodemus, whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That is at the core of the good news that we preach. We go into all the world with the message of how they can have eternal life, how they cannot perish, as we'll read later on, but have eternal life. 
we're answering that crucial question, how can I live forever? And here in our text today, we see Jesus is showing Nicodemus the way. Now, if you remember from last week, we're still in the middle of this after-hours meeting between Nicodemus and Jesus. And we read at the beginning that there was this man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, that he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher, come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God was with him. And then we see that Jesus does not just have a friendly chat with Nicodemus. In the course of this, Jesus is speaking with alarming authority and and it increasingly Uh, sets Nicodemus back, or it it takes him aback. He doesn't know what what he's in for. Now, the text is actually divided into three sections. Last week, we covered the first two. This week, I'm focusing on the last one. There's really three sections. They work like this. Nicodemus says something, and then Jesus responds with something shocking. And then Nicodemus says something again, and then Jesus shocks him even more. And then Nicodemus says one more little thing, and then Jesus finishes them off, okay? Finishes them off at the end. The first two sayings of Jesus, they have to do with being born again. And we covered those last week. After that second and fuller description of being born again, uh, Jesus talks about the wind blowing where it wishes, um, and you hear its sound and the Spirit's work. After that description, Nicodemus has hardly anything left to say. We read here in verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? How can these things be? And he's probably not actually fishing for an answer here. He's 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 almost incredulous. He's basically saying, How can this be the truth? What are you talking about? How can how can it be that a man must be born again? How can it be that the spirit needs to blow where it wishes and needs to soften our hearts? Nicodemus here, he's he's really showing us that he's lost. He's lost in more ways than one. He doesn't know what Jesus is really talking about, and he doesn't know the eternal life that Jesus has come to bring. He simply says, how can these things happen? He's incredulous. Now, Nicodemus was a teacher, right? He's a ruler of the Jews. He's a Pharisee. He's a teacher. He's a rabbi, a fellow rabbi. You can imagine he taught people, perhaps for many years, how they could be part of God's kingdom, how they could be part of God's people, how they could be right with God. He had taught people about this. He would have pointed them to the law. He would have pointed them to the sacrifices, to God's word. He would have said, you got to obey God's law. you got to worship him properly. And he would have taught all those things and taught them probably quite well. But now Jesus tells him that there's another requirement. There's more than that. There's something outside of man's control that has to happen for you to enter the kingdom of God, for you to be part of God's people. And that is, you must be born again. Or to put it another way, the word actually means the same thing. You need to be born from above. You need something to descend upon. You need something to happen to you. You must be born again. Nicodemus does not know what to do with that. And that leads us to our text today, This is Jesus' final response to Nicodemus, looking at verses 10 to 12. Let me read these again. Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So first, we see here that Jesus rebukes Nicodemus. The Lord rebukes him. Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Ouch, right? You know, Jesus is saying, don't you have a master's degree, Nicodemus? And this went over your head, hey? Oh, you have a PhD even. Okay, good to know. Well, this is shocking that you don't understand this. You haven't reflected, Nicodemus, on the promise of the prophets You haven't thought about Ezekiel 36? I will sprinkle clean water on you. I will put my spirit in you. I will give you a new heart. You haven't read chapter 37 yet of Ezekiel, even though you're a teacher. You haven't read about the valley of dry bones and how the wind comes and brings life to what is dead? None of this is ringing a bell with the whole born again talk? You haven't reflected on it? 
You're the teacher and you don't even understand the prophets and the promise of the prophets. And Jesus actually rebukes him further. Not only do you not understand, Nicodemus, you don't believe. You don't receive. Verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Jesus calls him out. He calls out not just his lack of understanding, but his lack of faith. He says, you're skeptical, Nicodemus. You do not receive the truth of what I'm telling you. And yet, this passage is not just a rebuke. Far from it. Jesus does not just rebuke Nicodemus for his lack of understanding, his lack of faith. He's merciful to Nicodemus. Extremely merciful. And let me show you that. He changes tracks after verse 11. And he no longer tells Nicodemus what must happen to him in order for him to be saved. Instead, he tells Nicodemus what God himself is doing right now to save lost people just like Nicodemus. He, he, doesn't, he takes Nicodemus' gaze away from himself and what must happen within to what is going on outside, to what God is doing in sending his son. It's like Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, I've taken you as far as you can go with these earthly explanations about the miracle of the new birth. We're talking about being born again, and that's, apparently that's too high a truth, right, for Nicodemus. He cannot explain it any further to an unregenerate heart. But he doesn't just leave Nicodemus there. He doesn't just say, sorry, can't help you. I mean, go get born again and come back and we'll talk. Like, Jesus doesn't say that to him. Instead, Jesus tells him what he himself is doing on this earth at that moment to bring this kingdom of God to earth and to save people like Nicodemus and to bring about the new birth. Nicodemus cannot reach it. He cannot grab these truths. But Jesus is telling him, don't worry, I've come to bring this down to you. I've come for you. Jesus has descended to bring new life to him, to bring the kingdom. Jesus says in verse 13, and we'll read 13 to 15 again, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now this is where we're going to camp out for most of our time here. First, let's consider the business about ascending and descending. This is really point one. It's just a, I'm just putting as a heading for you to hang your hat on. Who can ascend? Who can ascend? The one who came down. Okay, so point one is who can ascend? The one who came down. He says to him, I've told you earthly things you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And then he goes right into this explanation of ascending into heaven and descending from heaven. And he calls himself the son of man. Now what's Jesus getting at here? He's making reference to having heavenly knowledge. You know, sometimes the Jews thought that various figures in Old Testament history perhaps ascended and then they would come down with knowledge or perhaps that that was possible for them, that if we could ascend and get knowledge and we'd come back down. But Jesus is saying, no, it's not about that. It's not about, none of them have done that. No one has successfully ascended to heaven, received all the heavenly wisdom of this salvation, of this kingdom, and have brought it down to you. The only one who's done that is the one who descended. So the emphasis isn't on him going up. The, the emphasis is on he's, he's from above. He's the ascended one. He's the one who, who has already ascended and he is descending now. And yes, the truth is as well that he will ascend again. But he's making reference to the fact that he has exalted knowledge. He has something to reveal to, to Nicodemus. That he's coming from heaven with a message. The emphasis is of that, that he's come down. Heaven is his rightful home. So the Son of Man is standing there right in front of Nicodemus saying this to him, saying, I have this knowledge. I have the heavenly things. How could I tell you these heavenly things? You can't handle these heavenly things yet. I have that knowledge. I have all of this, but you're not ready for it. There's a great distance between earth and heaven. 
And really this brings us to this question, this whole idea of ascending. Who can ascend? Who can ascend? It reminds me of Psalm 24 and that great question. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Can any of us raise our hand and say, I qualify, I can ascend, I can come worship God? No, we all fall short, don't we? We No one is good. No one does right. We're all together become corrupt, the Bible says. So who can ascend? Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Ultimately, only God himself is worthy. Only God himself. And Jesus Christ, as the God-man, God in the flesh, the Word made flesh, he is the one who can ascend the hill of the Lord. Sometimes we read the Psalms wrong, wrongly, by the way. We, we don't see in it that in David's prayers, he's a shadow of the great the greater son of David, the real king of Israel, Jesus himself. He's the blameless one. He's the true righteous one. He's the one who can ascend the hill of the Lord. We see here a similar idea in Proverbs as well. This is interesting. Proverbs 30, verse 4. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who ha- Does it sound familiar? You think maybe Jesus has this in view? Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. Proverbs 30 verse 4. Almost gives you chills to think that that's written in Proverbs. You think that is exactly a picture of the wisdom and the knowledge and the heavenly blessing that Jesus has come to bring. The implication, though, in this is that it's God, right? It's only God who can bottle up the wind. Say, I've got all the wind right here. It's only God who can soak up all the oceans with the edge of his beach towel, as it is, right? Who can gather up the waters in a garment. Only God can do that. Only God has ascended to heaven and has come down. God is the only one. There's that... There's this contrast here as well with what what Jesus is saying with the giving of the law. We read in Deuteronomy 30, For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. Now that's, that kind of makes us have to think a little bit because here we have talking about the giving of the law and how that's come down from heaven for us. It's right there. This, uh, this ability, this uh, clear instruction of what God has for us in his law, it's right there. It's right here. It's not like God saying you have to become this Gnostic, weird priest guy who ascends into the heavens and gets this hidden knowledge. He says, no, I've written a book. It's right here. Here's the law. Do it. But there's a bit of a problem there, isn't there? We can't do it. And that's what we see in Deuteronomy 28, 29, 30, all throughout there. You ever notice when you read that, there's, there's, God promises, if you do it, here's the blessings. But if you don't do it, here's the curses. And then God kind of tips his cards, as it were, and shows you you're not going to be able to do it. Because the section on curses is like three times as long as the section on blessing. It's like the blessings is a hypothetical, it seems. And, and really, it's like, yeah, if, if you were an Israelite standing there on the mountain that day, you'd say, I think we're getting cursed. It's just, I just That was a lot about us being cursed and really detailed how we're going to be sent to, to Babylon and all. Like, we're getting cursed. So even this, when we read Deuteronomy 30, the commandment's there. And there's something about it that is graciously revealed, yet we don't have the power to do it. We don't have the ability to do it because of what? Because of our sin. We are so lost in our sin, that even if God gives us the law perfectly right in front of us and gives us all the instruction that we need, he puts training wheels on our spiritual life, as it were, we can't ride the bike. Why? 
Well, because as Jesus said, you're dead in your sins. You need to be born again, Nicodemus. Now, it's interesting that Paul takes up these same verses from Deuteronomy in Romans 10. He says this in Romans 10, verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, and here's the contrast, do not say in your heart, and he's quoting right from Deuteronomy, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is, and here's where Deuteronomy was say, Moses was saying more than he probably even knew, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Isn't that glorious? For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. It's glorious. And it goes on, verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's near you. The gospel is near you, Paul says. See, the way of the obedience to the law will not work. You must be born again. And that's what the background of Ezekiel. I will put my spirit in you. I will cause you to keep my statutes and law. We need God to do that work of regeneration before this is even possible. Something has to happen to you to deal with your spiritual deadness. Our sins need to be dealt with, which leads us to the next point. The Son of Man will be lifted up. So here, we, the first point, really, we've talked about who can ascend, only the one who's descended. We've been talking about Christ has come down to reveal this. He's, he's come down with the gospel. But now we're going to talk about the Son of Man being lifted up. You see this language of, of the direction of it in the text. The ascended one who descended will be lifted up. Okay, verse 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Here's that idea, lifting up. Now this phrase is used throughout John when describing Jesus' death on the cross. We read in uh, John 8, 28. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And he's referring to his death on the cross. He's, and, and when he says, you'll know that I am he, he's saying, you'll know that I'm the one from above. And that's what it says in the context of John 8. I'm the son sent from the father. I am the one from above. And when you've lifted me up, then you will know. In John 12, 32, he says it again. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is the, that's from the hinge of the gospel of John where we're about to turn from all these, this book of signs into the book of glory. And we're about to see him, the hour has come for him to be glorified, exalted, or in this case, lifted up. And you notice that there's a double meaning there. Jesus is going to be physically lifted up on a cross for all the world to see. They will come by, they'll see him on the hill of Golgotha. And, and they will look at him and they'll read a, the sign above, written in three languages. This is the king of the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. He'll be physically suspended before the people, lifted up. But he would also be lifted up, that is, exalted. And that's the mystery of, of John. The hour of Jesus' glorification, the hour of his exaltation, is the cross. And that's the backwards kingdom. That's the upside down nature of God's kingdom that we learn that he who is, that he would be first must be last. That the greatest of all becomes the greatest of servant. That the lowest moment in human history, the worst moment, the most evil that was ever done turns out to be the most glorious display of God's love that the world's ever seen. That hidden in that horrible moment, which we would want to say is bad Friday, it's turned around. It's Good Friday. This is the greatest and most glorious thing that God has done as we tie it as well, obviously, to the resurrection. 
He, in Isaiah 52, 13, we're talking about the servant who would be pierced for our transgressions. But before that it says, he shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Isaiah 52, 13. You see, John ties these things together. The cross of Christ and the exaltation of Christ. Jesus would be lifted up on the cross in a humiliating death Now you need to picture that. You need to know that. That he was crucified in weakness. In shame. Everything about it was shameful. He he hung there naked. He hung there bloody, whipped. He hung there with people jeering at him. Saying, you who said that you could save others, save yourself, why don't you? He died in profound weakness. Profound shame and sorrow. And yet, John will not let you think just that about the cross. It is his exaltation. It is his triumph, his victory over sin, over death, over Satan. It's his payment that makes possible, and not just possible, that makes actual the salvation of the world, of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. It was there on the cross, as we read in Colossians, that Jesus put the spiritual forces of darkness to open shame by triumphing over them on that cross. His death was the payment that relinquished any hold that the evil one would have on us as God's chosen people. His death was the payment that turned away God's wrath from his people, that made mercy possible, that brought mercy to us. But there's something really specific, actually, being referred to here in John 3, 14 and 15. Jesus will be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness, the bronze snake. We read that. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. What is that getting at? Well, if you've read your Bibles recently, read through it, recommend that, read read the scriptures every day. Numbers 21, we read this. You might want to turn there. Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. From Mount Hor... They set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Weird story, isn't it? You think, why did God give him that to do? Why didn't God just maybe just heal them? Or just say, okay, serpents are gone now. No, he says, no, make a pole. Put a loathsome serpent on it. Make it out of bronze. Hold that up. Lift it up so that people need to look at it to be saved, to have their to be healed, to to have the the venom leave their leave their bodies and and to not die. This is a picture of salvation in Christ. Look and live. Look and live. You know, Jesus would later on in his ministry, after his resurrection, he would take his disciples on a tour of all the Old Testament scriptures. Don't you wish you were there? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wouldn't that be glorious to have a full Old Testament biblical theology class with the Lord Jesus himself? Well, they did. They received that. And what we see there, though, in that statement is that the whole Bible is Christocentric, okay? It's centered on Christ. He's the center of this whole book. The whole Bible 
is the Old Testament too is Christian scripture. It's one unified book. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures, in every part of the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now we may have wondered, why a snake? Why a pole? Why, why lift it up on a stick? Why use this means to save the people from physical death? Well, it's a picture. Everything has a purpose in God's world and in God's word. Everything has meaning. And this meaning is, was meant for this moment that Jesus could say to Nicodemus and say, you remember that story? You, you've taught that, I hope, teacher of Israel. You remember the, the bronze serpent on a stick? You might be thought that was a weird story. But that is exactly what God is going to do to save sinners. He's going he's gonna to lift up someone. And he says, the son of man, lift him up. And you're going to have to look to him to be saved. Look to his death. Look to this serpent on a stick. It's a picture of a greater salvation yet to come in Christ. That Christ would be lifted up on the cross. We read in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You think, why a serpent? Well, when Jesus was on the cross... He was bearing God's wrath. I, I, I struggle to even say these words, but he, he became sin. He became a loathsome thing, even to the eyes of the Father, so that God would pour out his wrath on him. Because he was no longer, this is why he calls out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, Jesus was bearing our sin. And as it were, God, looked, God the Father looked upon him and saw Not the son he loves, but he saw our sin and punished our sin on him, on that tree. He he became like the bronze serpent up on the cross, representing our sin, bearing our sin. As we read in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Do you remember we were talking about Deuteronomy earlier and we talked about the blessings and the curses? This is the, this is the glory of it, that everyone in the Old Testament deserved that curse. Everyone in the New Testament, everyone here today deserves that curse because we haven't done it. We haven't kept God's law. We have not loved the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So we're under a curse. Yet, God sent his son to be hung on a tree, to be pierced for our transgressions, that there he would stand, there he would bear the wrath of God, and he would bear the curse. So that what would we get? We would get the blessing. We would be the ones who can ascend the hill of the Lord with clean hands, with righteousness. And we say, but I don't have clean hands, Lord. No. No. But Christ does. And that's the great exchange. Your sins were placed on him and his righteousness is credited to you. You see, this is why we call it good news. This is why we say amazing grace. This is incredible that God would save us sinners. And it's free and it's gracious and it's it's for us from Christ. As we, I remember seeing this when I first became a Christian. I'm forgiven because he was forsaken. I'm accepted. He was condemned. But how does this salvation come exactly? What does God call us to do? Because the truth is, is it wasn't that just Jesus died on this cross and therefore, boom, the whole world got saved. Every human being, no no one missing out. Instead, we're called to do something. There's a connection that has to be made. And Jesus already talked about this with being born again. We need to be born again. But here he doesn't go inward with Nicodemus. He he, he tells him what has to happen outwardly. Something that is very easily explainable. What does he say to him? He says that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. To think about the bronze serpent. We read in, in Numbers, when he sees it, he shall live. He would look at the bronze serpent and he would live. Believe have eternal life. A few weeks ago, we read in our call to worship 
Isaiah 45, 22. I love this verse. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. In the, the King James, the, the word turn, they use look instead, which for my purposes, I, I like that better. In it, Look and live. Look and live. He's saying, look to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. This is Christ. Look to Christ on the cross and be saved. Look and live. It's as simple as it was in the Old Testament with being saved from physical death through the serpents, being bit by the serpent. We're all snake bitten, aren't we? With sin, under the domain of the evil one. We are snake bitten. We need salvation, but not just for our physical bodies. We need salvation for our souls. We need eternal life. Where will we get it? Look to the serpent on the pole. But it's not a serpent on a pole. Look at the Son of God. Look at the glorious Son of God in weakness, bearing our sin, marred, looking, looking for all the world as if he is completely defeated. As he looks like he's, he's lost the battle. Look to him and live because it is a victorious death on that cross. It's a victorious death. This is the graciousness of the gospel. It's not work hard and live Obey all the law and live. That's impossible as we've seen. It's not study hard and live. Give alms and live. Meditate and achieve Zen and live. Live in submission to Allah and live. No, just look. Just look. Look at Christ. See in him all that you need and say, I want that. I believe that. That's what I need. Look and live. Everyone who believes will have eternal life. That's the graciousness of the gospel. Notice again what Jesus said. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Whoever. Isn't that a beautiful word? Whoever. Are you, are you a, the worst sinner that you know? You qualify. You're a whoever. Are you, are, do you think you're pretty good? Hopefully not. But even if you're, if you're on the top of the, pe- top of the heap or the bottom of the barrel, you're part of the whoever. It includes you. It includes me. It includes your worst enemy. Whoever believes. And notice again, it's believes. It's not whoever keeps the law, whoever obeys it all, whoever pulls himself up by his spiritual bootstraps. It's whoever believes. It's faith alone. Do you trust Jesus for your salvation? If you do, you're saved. You have eternal life. That's what he says. You know, I mentioned earlier that eternal life, this is the first instance of that phrase in the Gospel of John, and it's beautiful. Life everlasting. Life for ages and ages, forever and ever. Eternal life. We will read of eternal life 17 more times in the Gospel of John. And this, because this is what Jesus came to give us. We read in John 10, 10, I came that they may have life. And have it abundantly. And what is it exactly? Well, Jesus himself tells us the core of it. It's not just long life in some neutral space. It's not just, that, it's not just temporal. Just, oh, I get to not die and keep going. That's great. It's not just that. Eternal life is great and glorious because it's connected to the one who is life itself. Jesus says, In John 17, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What is eternal life at its heart? Knowing God. Knowing God, being with him forever and ever. If heaven, if you could have heaven without God, it wouldn't be heaven. If we could have eternal life without him, it wouldn't be, it would be hell. It would be hell to us. He is the life. Right? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one who brings us this eternal life. In Psalm 63, we read, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. That's what Jesus came to bring. A superior pleasure than anything this world has to offer. 
If you were to gain the whole world but lose your soul, what worth would it be? You would be most to be pitied. But he came that you would have more than this world has to offer. You'd have eternal life. And what is eternal life? That they may know you, the only true God. We were made for him. You see, that's the tragedy of our sin that we often don't think about. We think of our sin and our sin brings punishment. And punishment's bad. And so I want out of punishment. But you know what's worse than punishment? Being out of fellowship with God. Being separated from God. Just think about it with your kids and with, in your family. It, you know, often, uh, often a, a kid will uh, do something bad. That uh, does happen, even at my house. And they're worried about the punishment, right? They're worried about the punishment. That's the thing that has got them worked up. But you know what's worse than the fear of punishment? The worst thing is to have a grieved relationship with your family. The worst is being out of fellowship. It's, it's not that you have to say sorry to your sister because you, you hit her and, okay, now I said sorry, now I'm not going to get, pun- now the punishment's done and we've got discipline and all that's all over, good. No, what we want to see happen is reconciliation. That the break of love has been mended. And how much more so with us and God? Our sins haven't just become a problem for us with our punishment, but they have separated us from the love of our Father in heaven. And the great glory of the gospel is not just that you get your sins forgiven and that you get to live forever, it's that you get to live with him, that you get to live in his love and in his light and that you get to be with him forever. This is what the psalmist said when he said, my soul thirsts for you, all I want is more of you, God. That's what Jesus has come to bring. This exalted son has descended in order to be lifted up on the cross, that he would draw all men to himself, that he would bear their sins, that he would purchase their redemption and give them eternal life, that he would bring us into the presence of God forever. So where do we go from here? Well, I posed this question to the youth on Friday night. I said, is Is being a Christian or becoming a Christian easy or hard? Is the Christian life costly or free? Is it like taking up your cross or is it like finding a treasure hidden in a field? And the answer should be clear as I go on here that it's both at one and the same time. A rich young man once came to Jesus seeking eternal life. After establishing that he was a pretty all right guy, Jesus told him what he needed to do. Go sell all your stuff, give it away, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. But the man wouldn't do it. Why? He loved his stuff too much. He loved this world too much. Covetousness had a grip on his heart, and the disciples really couldn't believe it. How could this fine fellow not get in? Right? And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, Only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Rich, poor, respectable, or vile. It is impossible with man, but with God all things are possible. And that's the easy part. The easy part is that God does it. God causes you to be born again. And he he just tells you, come. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Just come. Just believe. Just receive. Just look and live. It's it's impossible, but it's also easy. It'll cost you everything, but it's also completely free. Jesus paid it all, and you only stand to lose your sins and your pride. It will cost you all of that. and, And, you know, that will hurt a little bit, won't it? Dethroning yourself as the Lord of your own life. That's the hard part. But it's a good kind of hurt. 
isn't it? It, The pain of that, it's like the removal of cancer. It's like the healing of a wound. Better yet, it's like the resurrection from the dead because that's exactly what salvation is. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God. It's easy, but it costs you everything. You have to look to him. You can no longer look to yourself to be saved. And this is what he's saying to Nicodemus. No more going your own way. Look to him and be saved. Maybe you're still like Nicodemus today. What's the answer for you? The same thing that Jesus told him. Come. Come. Receive him. Don't be skeptical. Don't be incredulous. Look at the Son of Man lifted up on that cross. See him hanging there, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying. He is paying for the sins of the world and of all God's chosen people. It's, that's the easy part of the gospel. It's finished. Jesus paid it all, we sing. There's nothing that we can add. There's nothing we can do in our flesh. With man, it's impossible. But remember that God does the impossible. Look and live. Now, for those of us who have believed, and we've walked with God for a long time, perhaps, we must never graduate from the simple gospel of God's grace. As we grow in following God, we are not moving from grace to our own effort. We are not moving from faith alone to now faith plus our own works. No, our works are works of faith. Our works are empowered by God's grace. As we live for him, we're asking him, Lord, you've saved me, save me some more. Help me from this temptation. Deliver me from this. And and the question again is, where will you look for help as you struggle this week with sin yet again? Where where are you going to look? Look to him on the cross and look even beyond that to him interceding for you. He's had victory over sin and death and he has given it to us. We read, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. This is what John said earlier in John 1. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It's amazing grace. God does the impossible, and he does it through the simple action of our faith. We're born again, and we believe. And this is how John so wonderfully puts it in 1 John 5.1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Let's pray. Lord, we, we need your grace yet again, to not only hear your word and understand it as Nicodemus couldn't, but Lord, to receive it and to believe it. We need you to work in us to to blow that mighty wind from your spirit to awaken our deadness. And yet, Lord, we see how simple it is. You simply call us to come, to look and live, to believe. Help us not to miss the glory and the graciousness of the gospel. And may we declare it boldly to all our friends and family and everyone around us, the way of salvation that is so simple. It's so easy because you paid it all. In his name we pray, amen.